To say that the Reverend Marvin McMickle is a powerful presence in our community is an understatement. The president of Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School is widely known for being an active member in the fight for social justice. He is certainly not afraid to get political and has no fear of ruffling the feathers of fellow leaders. Whether you've read one of his 12 plus books, checked out his guest essays in the Democrat and Chronicle, listened to one of his speeches or sat in on a lecture, you are sure to walk away rethinking your your role as a member of the human race. McMickle announced his retirement as president of Colgate effective this June, but that doesn't mean his pursuit for racial, social, and economic justice will end. Joining me now in the studio is the Reverend Marvin McMickle, and it is an honor to have you back. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. Here. Good to see you. Happy thank New you. Year to Happy you. Happy New Year. Yeah. So, Marvin, when you look at the state of our society today, culturally, politically, morally, and so on, what do you see? Oh, terribly fractured um, along lines of politics, along lines of religion, along lines of gender, along lines of race, along lines of economic class distinction, along lines of region, uh, the coasts versus the middle of the country. Uh, and I don't see anybody on the horizon with the capacity to help us bridge many of those divisions. So uh, I'm hopeful that it can be bridged but I think we need people uh, in leadership positions who do not thrive on making the divisions starker than they are right now. And I think that's really uh, the biggest challenge that this country faces at the moment. And I know you said that you don't see someone at this moment who can help to bridge these divides. Is there a role that we can play just as everyday citizens and helping yeah, um, to make to that yourself. work? Yeah, be true to yourself. I mean, don't get... Don't, you know, one of the awful things about human nature is its capacity to get drawn into groupthink yeah. and to follow the crowd and to do what someone else is doing. And you are a little reluctant to be the contrarian in the room. It is the contrarians who have changed the course of history. And so I invite people to not give up their own value system in order to accommodate somebody else's or to not stop thinking when people say things that are just blatantly outrageous and largely untrue. So yeah, democracy is a one person at a time operation. We are not a monarchy. We're not an oligarchy. We, we are governed by ourselves. That's been the aspiration all along. I urge people to reclaim their own voice, reclaim their own authority to speak, to think, to vote, to disagree, uh, to advocate for their own positions as aggressively as they can. Well, for people who don't know, in addition to you being president of Colgate, you're a best-selling author who has written, as I mentioned before, more than a dozen books, a veteran pastor, a professor, and a speaker, and everything you do connects to faith and religion. Yeah. And I want to know, what was it that inspired you to take this course for your life? Martin Luther King, Jr. When I was 16 years old, I was called to the ministry. It would have been 1964. But I had not yet found a model for what I wanted that ministry to look like. So I just kind of kept the sense of vocation in the back of my mind. I was actually working for Playboy magazine. No. Well, I was printing it. Yeah. I worked for wow. Poor Brothers Printing Company. Yeah. Their sole product was Playboy. So here I was. I just finished a vocational high school in Chicago. I was running a linotype machine on the second floor. That's where the text was, the second floor. The pictures were on the fourth floor. Of course, I never went to the fourth <laughs> floor, you know, at the age of uh, 17 and 18. Um, but one day during the lunch break, I was reading a local paper that said that Dr. King was coming to Chicago mm -hmm. for this now famous 1966 uh, housing campaign to challenge segregation in residential patterns in Chicago, which was at that time the nation's most racially segregated city, not in the South. Chicago was first, Cleveland was second, uh, Gary, Indiana was third, and Detroit was fourth. Most people think that segregation was a Southern problem. He came to prove otherwise. I got involved in that uh, summer campaign and began to find in him and in that set of issues uh, the causes to which I wanted to devote my life. I got a PhD because he got a PhD. I started writing books because he was writing books. I mean, I, I just can't tell you um, the impact that his life had on mine. Well, you have been called a champion in the fight for racial equity, social and economic justice uh, in our country. And I want to know, you know, at a time when you, and you mentioned this, there's so much hostility right now in our nation. 
what do you think is one thing that we should be focusing on on a nation, whether to fix, change, to reverse the course of where we are right now? Is there one thing that we need to hone in on? You know, increasingly, I think we've got to think globally. Um, this, this notion of xenophobia, this notion of preferring one country, mm -hmm. one race, one anything over all the rest, uh, I think is, is uh, self-defeating. We are part of a global community. You can't fix the water problem. You can't fix uh, global warming. You can't fix the economy behind walls. These are global issues. So how do we begin to place ourselves in the middle of a global conversation about how to lift up fallen humanity in all of its sectors and all of its places? So, you know, Dr. King used to say, you'll pardon this uh, sort of reference back to him, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Well, there's enough injustice going on all around the world mm -hmm. that if we do not think about it from a global perspective, if we just keep thinking about our own little backyard, things are bad enough there, but you can't fix these things from one country. So for us, for you and your vocation and your call of work, um, to be in a vocation where one of your colleagues uh, in Turkey is murdered and dismembered and carried away in bags and there is no, you know, massive uprising, no horrific uh, pouring out of, of condemnations. You see, this is part of the problem because if it can go on there, then tyrants and autocrats anywhere else say, okay, I know how to silence my critics. I'll just kill them and cut them up and carry them away and who will care? So I think we have to think not only about ourselves and our own country, but we've got to place ourselves in a global perspective. And that's a president's job, by the way. That's a congressional task, is to think about what is the role of the United States in relationship both to allies and adversaries and find ways to live on the one earth that we share together. There is not another one, so we can't move someplace else. And if we don't act together, then you've got the Benjamin Franklin, you know, uh, notion, we'll either hang together, or we'll certainly hang separately. Well, something some of our viewers may not know is during your 20 plus years as pastor of Antioch Baptist Church in Cleveland, you made a run for polit high political office uh, two times. There were two unsuccessful runs. Yeah. One was in 1998 for a House seat and again in 2000 for a Senate seat. Yeah. However, as one journalist put it, uh, despite the losses, and this is a quote, you use the political pulpits to push your Christian-based social justice issues. So I want to know, for people who might say religious leaders have no role in the world of politics and vice versa, uh, and stand by that philosophical notion of separation of church and state, how would you respond? Yeah, I don't think that you ought to use your political position to advocate for a theological position. You should not... Uh, use the offices of the Congress, the Senate, the presidency, the state legislature to advance a denominational issue like baptism or how to take communion. That clearly is a division that we ought not bridge. But there's nothing that suggests that persons who are in the ministry cannot take their own social justice perspectives on feeding the hungry, caring for the naked, caring for the imprisoned. Those may appear in sacred texts, but they have an easy transfer into the public sector. So that so long as you are not using your political office to advance a narrow religious agenda, which, by the way, many conservative Republicans do, they, they use their political position to advance what they perceive to be um, a religious ideology, whether it is uh, same-sex marriage or a woman's right to choose. Okay, I, I would not want to limit myself to a handful of things uh, by the way, concerning which most of the country has a very different point of view than these on the far right. But um, people were concerned when I ran that I would somehow try to become the Christian U.S. Senator. No, I, understand. I read the Constitution, too. I know just exactly what it says. I do know, by the way, that the notion of the separation of church and state did not appear in the Constitution, which many folks did not know. Um, but it does say that there should be no established religion. Yeah and that Congress shall not seek to set one up or prohibit the free exercise thereof. I'm all for that. 
Well, you have criticized the White House and white evangelical leaders uh, most recently um, into what you referred to as the sound of silence. And you, you took a cue there from Simon and Garfunkel's 1960s hit of the same title. And this was in relation to anti-Jewish hate crimes, pipe bombs that were being sent to political and cultural leaders. Um, and you wrote this uh, in a guest essay for the DNC. Where are Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, Lindsey Graham, Jerry Falwell Jr., Franklin Graham, Tony Perkins, and other apologists for Donald Trump? Is it a mistake that all of these events are occurring when the president of the United States regularly fires up his base with slogans designed to fuel division between people based upon race, religion, region, and political parties. Uh, and you went on to conclude by saying terrorism is at work in the United States, and you quoted Dr. King, who said, the problem is not the vitriolic words of bad people, the but the silence appalling silence of, of good people. people. So first, how does your definition of terrorism at work in the U.S. differ from what we're hearing from the president of the United States right now? Terrorism is pipe bombs in the mail. Terrorism is targeted attacks on people based upon religion, based upon um, sexual orientation, based upon anybody who is imposed upon, you know, to a life-threatening situation based upon who they are as human beings. I don't know what he means by terrorism because I don't see what he's talking about. If he's talking about the one or two instances that he quoted in his speech the other night of persons who... who uh, carried out horrific crimes. I would just remind him, most of the crimes in this country are by far committed, both in terms of number and in terms of percentage, by native-born Americans. So you cannot, here again, this is a targeting. You say, okay, here are three instances when a person that came across the border, three out of millions, but here are three. Let's look at these terrible three things and say that if we could just build a wall we could keep these three people out and ignore the fact that there are 10 million people in this country who are performing perfectly as citizens without having documentation. They're not killing anybody. So I don't know what the president means. And you know what? I don't think he knows what he means. I think he is still appealing to uh, a, a base that needs someone to hate. And I think one of the dangers of uh, the white population in America, not all of them by far, but for those that, to whom he appeals, is I think there is a real concern about a changing demographic in the country and the loss of a white majority and the sense in which uh, immigration policies uh, either add to or slow down uh, that population shift. So for those who are really frightened by the thought of there not being a white majority in the country, Immigration is, a, is one easy target to say, if we could just fix this, we could slow this down. But the notion that immigrants are the causes of all of our violence is laughable. I'm going to transition yeah. just a little bit here, because uh, I read that one of your greatest memories uh, and your time in Cleveland was throwing the opening pitch at the Indians game. This was in <laughs> July 1994. On the 4th of July. So yeah. I want to know, what is one of your fondest memories of your time at Colgate? Uh, this is going to sound odd. It, it, it really will. But I, I think we have known for a good while that the campus itself, beautiful as it is, was more than we needed and more than we could afford if our mission was education and not real estate. I'm, I'm really happy, though I'm torn, that we were able to make a decision about the future of the school that was not necessarily linked to the future of the campus. Uh, I'm not a real estate developer. I'm not interested in, you know, zoning ordinances. And so I'm, I'm into theological education, which we can provide in almost any setting that we can design. So I'm leaving Rochester, at least leaving Colgate, Rochester, Crozier Divinity School, having been content, that's a better word, that a really hard decision was made, a, re a really big hurdle was crossed, and we were able to handle it in a way that brought our alumni, our donor base, our students, our faculty and staff with us. And for people who don't know, you're talking about the transition of the campus from where it is right now, right. and the, the, the beautiful grounds, yeah. by the way, and you're moving to the 320, Village Gate. 320 North Goodman Street. Well, yeah. near Village near Gate. Near Village yeah, Gate. Not in the yeah. main yeah. complex, but around the corner. Yeah, we're renovating a property, 
that'll have about 11,000 or so square feet, all on one level, so no more stairs, all with free parking, uh, 21st century technology designed specifically for our use. Now, will it have all of the archways, all of the stonework, all of the uh, apparatus of uh, a 19th century educational institution? This school was built sort of with Yale in mind. And uh, okay, we're not Yale, and we're moving, and I'm glad about it. Very good. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we have to close for now, but Reverend Marvin McMichael, is always an honor to have you on the program. Thank you for your passion for our community, and we wish you the best. Thank you so much. Endeavors. Good to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.